Welcome everybody back into Nerd Sesh. As always, I'm Carson Brabber and alongside me is Logan Camden. And I apologize if we've been a little bit light on the content this week. We did have a trivia gauntlet episode this Monday. Hope you guys enjoyed. We went on with Jason. That went up over the weekend. So hopefully there was enough content to keep you guys satisfied. But I've been going through the 12 days of sickness, Logan. You guys will remember I was talking about being under the weather last week. And then that transformed into either a sinus infection or pneumonia. The, I guess, amateur doctors who I'm going to can't tell the difference. So I've just been battling that. And frankly, I'm just happy to still be here alive speaking to you all today because we've got an exciting episode, Logan. We have been teasing this one for months and months and months. And with the playoffs finally near, it is the time to do it. We are going to be ranking our top 10 NBA players, and we both agree that the criteria here is for a playoff run because ultimately that it is what matters most. So Logan, before we get into it, who were some of the toughest omissions for you from this list? I'm sorry, Boston Celtics fans. I omitted Jason Tatum from my top really? 10 list. Uh, I don't have him here. He was by far my toughest cut. I don't feel great about it. Uh, I'll get into the real nitty-gritty, the specifics, when we get into the players that are on my list on why I prefer them to Tatum. But, again, I omitted him, uh, I believe, from my top 10 scorers list. I, or, no, he was – no, I did omit him for LeBron. You did omit him. I omit him from this list as well. I don't feel great wow. about it. I appreciate what he does as a player. I think he is a really phenomenal player, but he's number 11 for me. You know, he is the okay. first guy off. They, these cuts are tough. Somebody couldn't make it. He was a tough cut. Kevin Durant is a very tough cut from my list as well. Uh, Jalen Brunson was one of the tougher cuts that I have to make off my list. Those were the ones that I agonized over. Everybody else was, everybody else was less brutal. The most brutal is Jason Tatum, and I hate, I hate being that guy again, man. I know Celtics fans are not going to be happy, but he was by far the toughest cut for me. Here's the problem that we have, Logan. There are twelve top ten players in the NBA <laughs> right now. Like, just straight up. The number of dudes who I have confidently called top 10 players throughout mm -hmm. the year is 12. There are two dudes who are going to get left off this list no matter what combination you go with. And 8 through 12, I think there's a lot of ways and I consider different combinations and maybe at different points in the year even might have gone slightly different directions. But ultimately, you have to leave two of those guys off. And I think that, that speaks to the really unique level of talent in the league today and the cross-section of generations where even if KD and LeBron and Steph aren't at their peaks, they're still so damn good that they are forcing their way into these conversations when normally the 35 plus year olds have given way to the young guys. And we do have some exceptionally young players rising into these conversations. Luka Doncic, SGA, even Jason Tatum, those guys are just 25. So it's a brutal list. Kevin Durant, you kind of just passed over. It's insane to me that Kevin Durant is not on your list and he's also not on my list. That's just the stage that we're at with his career. And for me, the reason for that is not that he isn't great. I mean, I would still classify him as a superstar basketball player, one of the best scorers on the planet. But the reality is his value there isn't what it has been for basically his entire career because of his diminished athleticism, his diminished ability to get to the rim, and overall, the lack of variety in terms of his shot making and shot quality. Obviously, he can hit a pull-up jumper over anybody at any time, and he's so devastatingly effective there at his size that he is still a great player. But when I compare him to a guy like his teammate Devin Booker, who isn't a great rim pressurer, but because of his physicality, because of just the variety of ways in which he initiates possessions, his footwork out of the post, he has more ways to get to shots to where you don't feel like he goes through these stretches of, okay, Katie, you're taking the same shot over and over again. And particularly these big physical wing defenders can disrupt you in those shots and katie had this flamethrower run a couple weeks ago and everybody was saying all right this man is invincible and then since then his last seven games he's under 20 points per game he's averaging two free throw attempts a night he's making three shots per game in the paint period not at the rim in the paint overall and that's just where i think other guys have the tiebreaker over him, largely because of two-way impact or because of physical imposition. I still think KD is amazing. I mean, he's a hyper-efficient 27-point-per-game scorer, but the league is crazy stacked. And then Logan, this may surprise you, this may surprise a lot of people, and this upsets me. 
because when I really think about dudes who I have called a top 10 player countless times this year, I have called Devin Booker a top 10 player countless times this year. I know you're shocked. I can see it in your eyes. And specifically my big take before this year was that I would take him over Jason Tatum. The reason that I now give Tatum the edge over Booker is not about Devin Booker, who I think has remained an incredible offensive basketball player, one of the most dynamic and versatile shot makers in the sport, if not number one, an improved playmaker from previous versions. It's really because of Jason Tatum's improvements. And I'll get to those more later, but basically his significant improvement as a pull-up jump shooter from last season and his added strength and more developed post-up game that has really improved upon a couple of the red flags that I had about Tatum as an offensive player and scorer. And I still think that Booker is a better offensive player, a better scorer and a better playmaker. But the gap there has diminished to where I think Tatum's significant advantages as a defensive player and a rebounder slightly outweigh Book's advantages as an offensive player so ultimately i have the two phoenix suns in my 11 and 12 spot and by the way you didn't mention jimmy butler who i think has to be one of the toughest cuts because of what he's done in those playoff environments some people some people he would be a tough cut for oh my god you have him so who is getting left off your list some people oh my god some people would have jimmy butler as a tough cut oh my god well i really am gonna lose a lot of sleep over the fact that i don't have katie and book here but uh I just think there are ultimately guys who make more multifaceted impacts and have more unstoppable traits. And uh, I ultimately had to go with those guys. But all right, Logan, let's get started. Who is in your 10 spot? In my 10 spot is a guy you just were talking okay. about. And that's Whoa. Devin Booker. Uh, Devin oh, Booker, oh. yeah. Uh, this I also, dude, this list, you said it all in that... Uh, prefix here to this show but i mean the league is so stacked right now this list was agonizing to make i've flipped so many positions of so many players trying to figure out what list what basically what you just said what order would i be able to lay my head on my pillow tonight and be okay yeah. with and that's what i went with in my 10 spot is devin booker and the reason is because he just had one of the greatest playoff runs in nba history d book put up 34 points per game five boards and seven assists a night on 59 percent from the field 51% from behind the arc, and 87% from the line. A true shooting percentage of 68.6%. He led the playoffs in points per game. And if you look at the scope of NBA history, minimum eight games played in a playoff run. It's the most efficient 30 points per game ever. I don't anticipate Devin Booker really replicating this. I'm going to be honest. It's, it would be mm -hmm. insane. I mean, it would be insane. It's one of the greatest playoff runs ever. But he gave us a glimpse of what he was capable of. And... I, I do understand what you're saying about with Tatum's defensive and rebounding advantages. I think Tatum has advantages in those categories, but I think he still has the offensive gap is where I go to. The shot variety, the shot palette, mm -hmm. the variety of how Devin Booker can kill you. And I think Devin Booker's a good defender. Is he on Tatum's level? No. There's just a difference in physical and athletic capabilities that limit Devin Booker from ever being as effective as Jason Tatum. But... I think the offensive gap is steep enough. I trust Devin Booker to run my offense as a legitimate number one playmaker. I trust him to get to his shots everywhere on the floor. If that's mm -hmm. on the low block, if that's in the high post, if that's from deep, if that's to the rack. Like, Devin Booker is just one of the best scorers on planet Earth, point blank, period. Because of this, uh, we have seen him develop as a playmaker because of how he weaponizes his scoring. And the variety is really where I draw the line with Tatum. Tatum has these spells. And granted, yeah. he has been much better much better this year and that's what it made that's why it was so difficult to leave Tatum off the list this year you talk about the pull-up jump shooting he's been so much better in the mid-range he's been so much better from behind the arc like stupid efficient mm -hmm. I got these love scars with Jason Tatum man I got these love scars that just keep popping back up where I just can't let go of the pain and the hurt that Jason Tatum has inflicted upon me when I put my faith in him Devin Booker hasn't done that to me. And so that's why I had to leave Jason Tatum off. Is I still have these flashbacks, these PTSD, this, is Tatum going to do it to me again? I don't ever really feel that way with D-Book. I can put my full faith yeah. into D-Book, and I trust him to do his thing offensively, where I still wonder, can Tatum do it? And that's the sad reality, Carson, is if the Celtics and Tatum, and if they do their, their thing again this year, it's going to be, oh, it's same old Celtics. I want to believe in you, Jason Tatum. I want to say that you're a completely different player. This is the year for him to show it, man, and for him to finally cement himself. I'm talking about concrete 
There's no doubt. The only way mm-hmm. to do that, in my opinion, is to get to the finals, uh, to ascend the mountain, to get it done. Uh, I just would rather have Devin Booker as my number one lead offensive guy in a playoff run, and that's my differentiator. That's why I'd rather have D-Book over Tatum. And, again, damn, this was hard to do. Tatum, I want to give mm-hmm. you some love. I want to give you some props. I think you were one of the best players on planet Earth, but you're number 11 for me, and I can't slide you in there. Also, one more thing I want to add on. Yeah. So did, did you consider Joel Embiid for this because he's not currently healthy? I, I didn't I didn't consider Embiid. Okay. That okay. makes sense. I have Embiid on my list because they still okay. say that they expect him back for the playoffs, and I would just rather presume health for the league okay. if we're going to do a list like this. Leaving Embiid off of it feels wrong to me. But yeah, that would be great, Logan. I would have loved to do that. <laughs> I would have loved to have Devin Booker in my 10 spot because you're preaching to the choir here, man. There are a few people who I feel value the greatness of a pure shot maker like Book and the shot variety, the versatility that he has as much as I do. Like, I love that and I love Book. And basically, the points you're making are the points that I made as to why I did slightly prefer him to Tatum before this season. I don't have Tatum at number 10, but since we're having this conversation, I'll just give my Tatum spiel now. I mentioned those couple of key improvements that he's made. Number one is the improvement as a pull-up shooter. Personally, I am always going to prefer a more versatile shot maker. I don't ever want you to be specifically reliant on one shot because that one shot might leave you at any time. That's why it is so crazy valuable to be able to get to your mid-range step backs and your mid-range turnarounds and your step throughs and just have this complete arsenal and book obviously has an advantage to Tatum there. But when it is particularly problematic to be very reliant on one specific shot, and particularly the pull-up three, is when you're not actually great at that shot. And that was the case for Jason Tatum last year. He was a 29% pull-up shooter from deep in the regular season, and his inconsistency from deep in the playoffs, where he was 32% overall, very specifically led to some erratic performances in that signature Jason Tatum one in every three nights he's off kind of deal that has been a problem really throughout his career. This year, He's making 35% of his pull-up threes. So that is a dramatic improvement. That is going from worst volume pull-up three-point shooter in basketball to not the best, but very solidly in the middle of the pack among like the really good volume pull-up shooters. And post-All-Star break, he's at 39%. So although I don't think he is a transformed shooter and those pull-up numbers have fluctuated a bit from him year to year, I do think he is an improved shooter. And if he is making those pull-up threes as a good at a good clip like he is right now, his reliance on them isn't really a problem. Now, you still can have a stretch where you go ice cold, and I would like you to have multiple counters and ways to dig yourself out of that slump. That is a little thing that matters. But broadly, if you are making a good portion of your pull-up threes, the ceiling that you have when you also have Tatum's physical traits is really high. And that is the second component. Tatum added, he said 12 pounds of muscle in the offseason. And normally you hear a story like that and you're like, all right, let's go out and actually see it in the regular season. But we have, we have seen a more strong and physically mature Jason Tatum. And that has specifically manifested itself in his post-up game, which is what we're talking about when you're adding variety as a shot maker and specifically to be able to have a way to impose yourself physically but not be reliant just on getting to the rim where you can dominate that short intermediate area of the floor it's something a lot of the best playoff performers have in common jimmy butler rises in the playoffs because he is so good from that area Kawhi leonard rises in the playoffs because he's so good from that area those are wings who are comparable but Nikola Jokic is unstoppable because you get him the ball in that area and the guy just doesn't miss and Tatum is posting up more than twice as often as he was last season and scoring with 83rd percentile efficiency there and he just has this ability to unleash a very unique combination of that physical force and that skilled shot making so I still have my issues with Jason Tatum and you're right dude I do still have my fears I have my scars as well where I'm like I need to be sure that you can consistently make good decisions in these playoff environments, that you will not let defenses off the hook, that you will get downhill, that you will impose yourself physically, that you won't go ice cold from deep and have no way out of it. And that scares me. But he has improved on the margins this year in a way that matters to me. And so even though I do think Book is the better offensive player, I would still rather have Book as my offensive number one 
when I think about how Tatum impacted some games in the playoffs last year, even when his shot was off with his rebounding, with the level he could defend at, where he can be like a tier one perimeter defender, I just think that ceiling exceeds Books. I trust Book more as an offensive player, but Tatum's overall ceiling in terms of impact is higher. And uh, I said last year that I got that the theoretical ceiling for Tatum was higher, and a lot of people were betting on that. But I think he has reached that level consistently enough this season to where even if the raw numbers don't look different, this Jason Tatum does feel a bit different to me. And the margin between them was already very close. And now it's very close, but I lean in Tatum's favor. And I think the post-up game is really going to be the final evolution of Jason Tatum's game. And I'm not saying he's not going to add any more to his game, but I think it opens the door to so many more possibilities offensively. You talk about chopping up the lulls. Uh, it not only does that, it gives him another alternative, really reliable shot to go to, but it also could really weaponize Tatum as a playmaker. I mean, think about it, dude. If he's dominating on the low block, potentially drawing doubles, uh, you know, becoming a really great passer out of that, um, doing that from all over on the floor. And hopefully this just slowly diversifies his palette more, where he's getting downhill more. He's not taking, you know, I mean, that's just the thing with Tatum is kind of getting him into these really predictable tendencies that he likes doing the best players are really unpredictable. And once Tatum can really, you know, really get that out, that, that is the one encouraging thing I'd say about Tatum is that we haven't seen him stagnate, you know? Every year, Tatum has slowly improved at, at one thing or the other, right? I mean, really young Jason Tatum wasn't a playmaker at all. And during that finals run, we finally saw Tatum actually lean into playmaking where, you know, he's not Devin Booker level, but he's competent. You know what I mean? So... I'm still waiting on that theoretical version of Jason Tatum. I think he's going to get there. Granted, Carson, you know, he's only 19 years old, so the sky's the limit. He's only you know, 19. He's got, a, he's got a ton of time, but I think he's going to get there. I guess I just need to see it manifest itself, and I need to see it before I'm going to do it. But I think this could be the year, man. I think this finally could be it. I think everything is lined into place. The talent and the caliber of team around him, Yeah. the growth in his own game, he has gotten better. I think this could finally be the year that Tatum gets it done. Uh, that being said, I'm I'm not betting on it. I still got them. It's like this. It's the Embiid thing, man. It's the Sixers getting me every year. Tatum, you got mm -hmm. me a few too many times, man. So I'm not gonna bet on it, but I wouldn't be surprised. I think this is the year that if he can, he can ascend to cement himself in the top ten. Where we, you know what I mean? That's the goal. Where we can't argue anymore. It is inarguable that Jason Tatum is a top ten player. I think he yeah. can get it done this year. It's interesting. I saw somebody who I like tweet out the other day, Matt Issa, who's a good follow. Nobody has ever gotten more criticism for being a top seven to 10 player than Jason Tatum, which very well may be true, but it's also because there's no top seven to 10 player who people have tried to elevate to more than that more often. Like we can't act like it's, oh my God, all of hellfire is raining down upon Jason Tatum and the media hates him and we have no idea why. It's like, no, it's because Celtics fans will look you in the eye. Some of them, I'm not trying to generalize here, but there are definitely people out there who will say he is a tier one player. He is on the level of the Jokic's and the Giannis's and he's better than Luka and he should be MVP. And that is where you get the blowback. So that's the reality with Tatum. But man, he has been so good this year and his efficiency as a creator is unbelievable, including passes, 85th percentile pick and roll creator, 85th percentile isolation creator. Granted, he has great shot making alongside him, but he scores very efficiently out of those actions too. And you mentioned his playmaking. That's the thing with Tatum. He has these really impressive stretches as a playmaker. And then he has these stretches where he just kind of melts down. And that's what scares me is we have seen that in the playoffs before. I am betting on a more mature really in every way, Jason Tatum being just a bit better this year. Like I still have my concerns about him and I don't think having him at number nine where I do is higher than consensus. It's probably a little bit lower than consensus, but I do like him a little bit more than I did coming into this year because I think he's improved. My number 10, Logan, I don't know where you're going to have. You might not have him at all. I remember you had him very high on your list last year. I have Anthony Davis in my 10 spot. And I cannot read on your face if you have him or not, so no spoilers. He's averaging 25, 13, and 4 this year, rounded, with three and a half stocks a game on 62% true shooting. And simply put, he is the best defensive player alive. You can argue Wemby, you can argue Gobert. I don't think anybody masters the intellectual brilliance 
along with the physical maturity, along with the physical tools and the versatility that Anthony Davis has. The combination of quickness, defensive range, IQ, having probably the best hands at the center spot in the league when you're talking about affecting those interior passes and pocket passes. The length with the 7'6 wingspan, the shot blocking instincts and timing. And again, the fact that he does have the strength to hold up physically in those matchups where a Wemby doesn't yet. It's just unbelievable what he can do to teams. What he did to the Bucks last night in the clutch, dude. I mean, he just blew things up. Final possessions, he sticks with Dame on a drive, blocks him on a step back, and then on that final possession of the first overtime, Dame goes for another game winner, scoop layup, and AD rotates over to block it with perfect timing. First minute of overtime, he has this other phenomenal block on Bobby Portis off an offensive rebound. When he wants to be, he is just everywhere, and he is so dominant regardless of coverage. I mean, he can be a great drop defender if you want him to be. He is a great switch defender, right? He is really capable guarding in perimeter. We know what he can do in a high drop or hedging. His ability to affect both the roller and the pick and roll ball handler at the same time. When we talk about that defensive range, that sort of multifaceted impact is really one of one in the league right now. And last year in the playoffs, I get that he sort of ended things on a sour note because... He wasn't assertive enough offensively throughout that run, but really, Nikola Jokic just absolutely dogged him. Now, I will point out that Nikola Jokic absolutely dogged Rudy Gobert and absolutely dogged Bam Adebayo because that is what he does as the best player alive and maybe the best offensive player ever. But we were talking about that as the best defensive run that we've seen. He averaged 14 boards a game and four and a half stocks, blew up the Grizzlies series, blew up the Warriors series, and I just don't think that Jokic dominating him takes away from that because he would do that to anyone. So he's the best defensive player alive, in my opinion, and offensively is still a problem, man. He is a hyper-efficient post score, scoring with about 80th percentile efficiency out of the post on pretty high volume, and uh, his touch shot making is good. It's obviously not close to Jokic level. You can't look at those shots and say they're automatic, but he's 45% in the paint outside the restricted area, 53% on floaters, 50% on hook shots. That's something he's improved upon over the last couple of years. And when those shots are consistently falling, he's just really tough to stop. That combination of size, his body control and athleticism is obviously still really impressive. And that touch He's very tough to deal with in single coverage. He's not like one of the league's best one-on-one -on -one scorers, but he can really be a problem there. And then he does a lot of those play finishing things at a really high level. Elite offensive rebounder, put back score, very effective role man. The reason that he is at number 10 and I can't put him higher is because of his offensive inconsistency. He was under 23 a game in last year's playoffs and there were multiple performances where you're just like, AD, where are you offensively? And that comes from... His inconsistency as a jump shooter, where he's 39% from mid-range, 29% from three. I will always talk about the mythical bubble AD who was able to make 50% of his jumpers, 37% of his threes. That guy was unbelievable. That guy was a top three player on the planet. He does not exist anymore, and so he cannot be that sort of guy offensively. And then it is his inconsistent assertiveness. There's nobody else on this list, nobody else on the planet who you look at and just think, they would be higher on this list if they just asserted themselves all the time. Like, that's not really a normal condition for a truly great player to struggle with, but with AD, it is. And so you do have to deal with that reality. Aggressive AD would be even higher on this list. But I still think with the average level of aggressiveness you get, he belongs here. Ultimately, as much as I love Book and KD, and they are two of the greatest shot makers we have ever seen. Neither of them have the sort of physical imposition or the elite playmaking to make them truly unstoppable offensive forces. Both of them ultimately are going to wax and wane with their tough pull-up shooting. And you can have a crazy run like Book did last year on the back of that. I mean, that was perfect pull-up shooting, so don't expect that. But that ceiling is there. Or you can have a KD run from two years ago.
against Boston where a physical defense, right? He's getting moved off his spots and he really struggles with that difficult shot making. That's the range. And with AD, I know he is going to dominate the game defensively in a way that nobody else can. And overall, he's going to be a damn good offensive player with a really high ceiling there and a rare combination of athletic gifts and skill. So I still have him in my top 10. Regular season, maybe I would prefer the consistency of Book and KD, what they do offensively. But nobody changes the playoff series with their defense like AD. And when he's aggressive, he's just utterly dominant. That's why he's in my top 10. And he's higher for me. Um, I have him a few spots higher. It's weird, Carson. A few. It, it's... With AD, it's not only like an aggression thing, man. It's also a confidence thing. I feel like it permeates yeah. through the screen when you're watching AD hit these shots. And I don't know if it's a rhythm thing, if it's a... I don't know, did AD have a good day? Did he have a bad day? Because it, it, it is strange for a superstar to fluctuate this much in, in their consistency night to night, like the Bucks game that you're talking about. Not only was he dominant defensively, I mean, AD hits a big three during that game where it's just in rhythm. and it's He took like, eight threes, bro. Dude, over his last 10 games, Anthony Davis is shooting 39% from behind the arc. Like, if you get that Anthony Davis, I mean, again... It's like, I've seen it enough. We saw what happened in last year's playoffs where it was, oh, 28, uh, 15. Oh, mm -hmm. 26, uh, 14. You, you know, it's it, it's like a stock chart. Um, AD's awesome. If we could get him, I mean, you could argue AD top five. You know what I mean? If that guy was there every single night. Because it, mm -hmm. it's remarkable. The difference in how great he is when he's on and when he's off. When he is those post fades are knocking it down. It's like, damn, man, you can't block that shot. It is effectively unstoppable. He's so strong. He's just going to impose his will. And that Carson is a big part of why I do have AD a couple spots higher. It's what you talked about his, how he's the most game breaking defensive weapon. I'd say yeah. you could argue Wemby. I would hear Wemby. I would hear that out at this point, sure. but uh, AD transforms the game defensively the where you have an offensive superstar. AD can completely counter that. And I don't know. I've liked the aggression that I've seen from Anthony Davis these past couple weeks. I've liked the the percentages that I've seen from Anthony Davis these past couple weeks. I've liked the aggressiveness. I've liked the confidence. And I'm buying into that for this year's playoff run. I already know what he brings me defensively, but I'm buying into And maybe I'm drinking that purple and yellow Kool-Aid, man. I don't know. But I've really liked what I've seen from Anthony Davis offensively recently. And I hope and I think... I'm expecting more from Anthony Davis in these playoffs. I am expecting, I'm not expecting bubble AD. Like you said, man, that is a mythical yeah. creature. That is a once in a lifetime. That's a unicorn. That is the Loch Ness Monster. I don't know if we'll ever see that again, man. But I think he's going to be a lot better this year. And I'm expecting that. That is the bar. Yeah, I, I, I think Anthony Davis, uh, Anthony Davis catches a lot of flack. And I don't think he gets uh, enough respect for when he is on. Um yeah. It's ironic. We talk about the inconsistencies with Tatum. The difference is what AD does defensively because it is transcendent. I hope well, we get that guy, man. I will say the reason I have Tatum one spot above AD mm -hmm. is because of consistency. Because I think when you're judging basically everybody on this list, they are burdened with being a consistent number one. True. And I think if you asked AD to consistently be your offensive number one, that would present issues. And so that's why I have him at 10. It's because of the offensive inconsistency, but the defensive impact exceeds everybody else. And I do like what we're seeing from him offensively right mm -hmm. now, but last year, Logan was like as good yeah. an offensive regular season as we've ever seen from AD. And then playoffs, he still had his inconsistencies, but last night was the most shots that he's taken as a Laker. Obviously, you have the double OT, and he actually didn't take any shots in two OT. So he wasn't aggressive down the stretch. But in a game without LeBron, I just like seeing AD take that many shots. And AR and D-Lo were dialed in. You know what they I mean? They were dialed in. They were making big shots down the stretch. AD is great. It's been so awesome to see his resurgence over these last two years because what we saw from him in 2021 and 22, where he couldn't stay healthy, he wasn't the same offensive player. Like, that was just very concerning. And... I get it, dude. You're talking about drinking the purple and gold Kool-Aid. The Lakers are scary. When AD and LeBron are playing like they're capable of, they're just a really scary team who I would not want to draw in the first round. And AD, I tweeted this out, is one of three players who do not have a defensive player of the year, and it just makes no sense when you zoom out 
and you look at where they stand among the all-time great defenders, that's Tim Duncan, inarguably a top 10 defender ever. Scottie Pippen, inarguably a top 10 defender ever. And Anthony Davis, who I would say is inarguably a top 20 defender ever. But when you look at this era and the fact that your Marcus Smarts and your Triple J's have their defensive player of the years, not to say that AD should have won those specific seasons, but I do think he should have won in 2020 over Giannis. And he is just the caliber of a defender where he obviously should have one because he's been in the conversation for best defender alive for seven years. I mean, he was a dominant defensive force as a rookie even. Well, I think it's important to emphasize, too, how much of a team award Defensive Player of the Year has become, too, right? Yeah. Gobert is also a byproduct. And I'm not saying Gobert deservedly won those in Utah. You know, Gobert has the luxury of playing with McDaniels, with Anthony Edwards, with Cat, you know, a long guy like that. Uh, but 2020, Mar the Smart. Lakers were an elite defense, which is oh, why no, I'm not I think saying that's he should the year know. that AD makes the case. Yeah, I I'm just saying, like, most of it's a regular season award, and a lot of that is dependent by effort. Like, Marcus Smart had the benefit For of sure. having great defenders around him, too. Marcus you know Smart I mean? was stupid. Marcus Smart <laughs> is on a different level than any of these other ones. I don't even mean to lump Triple J in with him. He's obviously not the all-time defender AD is, but Marcus Smart winning was just flat out wrong do you think we'll ever see another guard win a deep play like i mean how great do you have to be as ever? a guard? yeah the fact that marcus smart has one and drew holiday doesn't upsets me i think it's really really tough for guards to win there's a reason that it's only moncrief and gp michael cooper if you consider him a guard really a wing and uh now marcus smart there will be very few and it'll be increasingly difficult because the league is dictated by bigs defensively and big wings. And Wemby exists. And Wemby exists. All right. Who do you have in your nine spot, Logan? I couldn't leave him off this list, man. At number nine, I have Jimmy Butler. And he's just so, he's shown us what he can do too many times, man. I When I was coming up with this list, compiling it, I just went, am I going to be confident coming on here and saying that Jimmy Butler is not a top 10 guy? I questioned on... Jason's show that we did the other day, am I wrong for questioning if Jimmy's ready? And I think I was. Like, Jimmy's dealt with a lot of injuries this year, and he's missed a lot of time. He's played 50 games this year, right? Like, Jimmy's never a regular season guy, but I've seen it too many times. And he's going to be 34 years old. Like, or he is 34 years old. He's getting up there in age. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if, you know, the plateau has already arrived and if we are slowly waiting on uh, going downhill. But I can't leave him off this list and specifically when we're looking at Jimmy Butler versus Jason Tatum because that was a debate I was having am I going to omit Jimmy am I going to omit Jason I think Jimmy's a better defender than Tatum I think he is a better playmaker and I think he has a more diverse shot diet and because of Tatum's reliance on pull-up jump shooting and pull-up threes granted he has improved I think that Jimmy is more unpredictable and also because of this reliance on pull-up shooting threes and pull-up jump shots in general you know, Jimmy's not as, uh, he's not as volatile at having these absolute scoring explosions. But he gives me a higher baseline where I don't think Jimmy is as prone to having these complete duds of games. And that was the distinction for me. I get the better defender, one of the best on planet Earth when he is dialed in and engaged. I get a better playmaker. In my opinion, I get a more well-rounded offensive player, maybe not a more well-rounded offensive scorer player. And then head-to-head, -head, I look at the track record, in the biggest spots, Game 7 of the 2022 Eastern Conference Finals, Jimmy Butler leads everybody in scoring with 35, while Tatum drops 26. Okay. Well, Game 7 of the Eastern Conference Finals last year, Jimmy Butler led everybody in scoring with 28 points, and Tatum dropped 14. And maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe it won't matter this season, Carson. Maybe Jason Tatum and the Celtics will mow through the East like we all anticipate them to, and the results-oriented thinking will say that Jason Tatum is better. And maybe 34-year-old Jimmy Butler is just too old. And he can't put that burden on his shoulders anymore. And it's time for Tatum to ascend as the guy in the East. But, like, I, I can't, I, I just, I got to stick to my guns, man. I Give me Jimmy. Give me Jimmy until further notice, until I'm proven wrong. Nobody expected the Miami Heat to go to the finals last year. Nobody. I said mm -hmm. every series I came on this show and I said, yeah, man, Miami's cooked. No athletes, too reliant on perimeter jump shooting, too... Too reliant on outlier shooting performances. Ah, oh, man, this has got to end at some point, right? And then somehow we blinked, and the Miami Heat were in the NBA Finals. Mm -hmm. I will never count Jimmy Butler out. I did it too many times last year. I did it too many times the year before that. I I've always counted Jimmy out. And for the final year, again, maybe this will be the year that I'm wrong. But until further notice, give me Jimmy. I get it, man. 
and you cannot push back against the playoff resume and how consistently he elevates his game. And it's so funny, dude. Jimmy doesn't have a 40-point game in the regular season since 2020, and he has eight playoff games with 40 plus points like nobody rises in the playoffs like jimmy and we know that and there are concrete reasons for that it's not just that he starts caring at another level it is because of some of the attributes that you mentioned his ability to physically impose himself the fact that he plays at this very controlled and self-assured pace as well and then his ability to kill you with his mid-range shot making i get it with jimmy and he is very playoff proven I do just feel like everybody on my list has more basketball ability and ultimately a higher ceiling than Jimmy Butler. And they more consistently demonstrate that they are great basketball players. Jimmy's amazing. I'm not trying to discredit Jimmy. I just think, first of all, Tatum is, in my opinion, a slightly more high-impact defender than Jimmy. It's close between the two of them. I think his ability to really impact games on the glass is significant, and as a slightly bigger, longer wing defender, there's a real matchup versatility there, although Jimmy is very versatile in terms of matchups too, and is a little bit more of a defensive playmaker. But then I think there's a different scoring ceiling that Jason Tatum has when he is on, when he is flamethrower from deep, and when he is rim pressuring and post up and making all the right decisions. I get it if you trust Jimmy a little bit more, and there's good reason to trust Jimmy. Ultimately, he's one of my tough cuts, and it does come down to the ceiling that I see with these other guys. And Jimmy, I do think sometimes we erase the inconsistent performances that he has and I think that we just focus on the mystique of oh my god Jimmy always gets better broadly he absolutely gets better but I mentioned this before like 2021 Jimmy has one of the worst playoff series of any star in recent memory and that just gets wiped away mostly deservedly so because of how he's elevated his game over the last two years but like it is also true that he raises his level magically as a three-point shooter in the playoffs, and I don't know that you can always expect that, and when that isn't the case, like in 2021, he struggles, and the fact that he doesn't have a great avenue to a lot of easy buckets, like yes, he's great at those tough shots from the mid-range, the short-range jumpers, but there are just other dudes who manufacture more easy offense, like that does matter, and that's why sometimes Jimmy does have these games where uh, he struggles. And uh, it's hilarious. Over his last handful of regular season games, he's scored 15 or fewer three times. That's what he does in the regular season. I love playoff Jimmy. I ultimately do think that there are just more gifted basketball players here who I have above him. But if he does his thing again, then I'll be the fool. You guys can throw pie at my face. Number eight, though, I have the most playoff proven player on this list. That is LeBron James. I have LeBron here. Logan, I'm very interested. Those Lakers seem to be climbing high on your list. LeBron is having a really impressive season, even though sometimes he hasn't cared and the Lakers haven't been all that great. But what he has shown us when he's dialed in has been extremely impressive. 25, 7, and 8 this year on 62% true shooting. That is the best efficiency of all his LA years. And the scariest thing is that he has consistently been making over 40% of his threes. And when he's at that level as a jump shooter, he has to be on this list. And I think that he has to be at this spot. He's been super efficient off screens and as a spot up shooter. And when you pair that sort of jump shooting with his overwhelming physical advantages, he just is a terrifying offensive player because he's a dominant mismatch attacker out of isos and post ups and particularly effective as a brilliant playmaker out of both those actions. You converge when you have a guy who physically can't hold up with LeBron and he's going to pick you apart. And then he's an effective role man. He's a good cutter. He has just rounded out his game offensively so nicely at this stage in his career where although he is still a really good pick and roll creator 74th percentile and we know that he can put defenses in predicaments with his downhill pressure and his playmaking and he can carry that offensive load when he wants to he's not going to do that throughout a game he is going to pick his spots more but the combination of his off ball value his uh, willingness to play there his shooting and then this bully ball and this playmaking, it's just a brutally effective and efficient offensive strategy. And he is still an elite transition player, clearly one of the five best transition players on the planet. So I really, really like this LeBron that we're seeing offensively, even though he's not going to carry you in the same way. 
And then defensively, his effort is going to be inconsistent. There are games where you'll look at LeBron and it's just like, oh, cool, he's not closing out. Like, he's flat-footed constantly. He's costing you. But when he wants to be, he's still an impactful low man. He's still an impactful defensive rebounder. And in playoff settings, more often than not, you get that version of LeBron. He was really quite good defensively in the playoffs last year. And that was even when offensively his jump shot was off and we know that his foot was injured. So he cannot single-handedly carry a team in the way that everybody above him can at this stage in his career. That burden is just too much. But in the right situation, when he is picking his spots, and I don't mean that to sound like he's a low volume player. He's just not going to carry the burden. He feels unstoppable in a way that few others do. And we saw that with the single game highs in last year's playoff run. Game six against the Warriors, game four against the Nuggets, when he is just bullying you relentlessly you are helpless. And when he is also making 40% of his threes, good luck, man. Like, that's the thing. The jump shooting that we have gotten from LeBron so consistently is why I think he has to be on this list. If he was in a slump like he was throughout last year's playoffs, he might not be here at all. But with what he has been doing as a jump shooter, I have him at number eight. I have LeBron one spot higher. I completely agree. I think he has to be on this list. And I'm really interested to see where you have my number eight guy, but I'll go ahead and I'll get uh, LeBron out of the way. The biggest thing is the jump shooting. 40.6% from behind the arc this season. It just gives LeBron two avenues to really unstoppable offense, which is from the perimeter as a spot-up guy off the catch. And big credit, man. A, 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 A reason why, you know, I sold my Lakers stock in the middle of the season. I was really high on him at the beginning. Now I'm slowly kind of, man, that Bucks game had me fired up, man. That Bucks game was sick. 19-point deficit, dude. Lakers claw back without LeBron. It was so funny on Twitter, dude, seeing all the people. Uh, it was like the SpongeBob meme where the building's on fire and he's running. Uh, it was panic mode for the Lakers. Oh, man, this game's mm-hmm. over. And then they storm mm-hmm. back. Big credit to D'Lo, to Austin Reeves, to this cast for consistently fighting, dude. Reeves and D'Lo give me a confidence in this team that I didn't have last year, you know, where... I trust those guys to to make plays and to help carry the load when LeBron isn't locked in. But bottom line, he's an elite three-point shooter, and he was the most efficient guy out of the post last season. uh, 1.25 points per post possession for LeBron last season in the playoffs. He's still one of the most physically imposing guys. Granted, he doesn't have that explosive first step. He's super strong. That doesn't go anywhere. And he's one of the most cerebral guys. Like, when the ball is in his hands and he is controlling the game— on the low block, on the perimeter. Like you said, dude, there's a different level of confidence and faith that I have in LeBron when he is locked in to handle business. And it was really hard for me picking between AD, uh, who I have one spot higher than LeBron because of what I think he brings to this team defensively. And it was really hard debating between him and my number eight guy, and that is Kawhi Leonard. And Mm -hmm. I played with, because, you know, Kawhi was number four, I believe, or or number three on my scorers list. I think he was four. Uh, Kawhi was really hard to gauge, and I still think Kawhi is really hard to gauge, and I hate pulling this freaking card, man, because it's it's LeBron's track record with all this success, and Kawhi's track record is the fact that he hasn't been able to stay on the floor. If you could guarantee me 20 healthy games of Kawhi, I don't know, man. Kawhi might be top four. He might be top three. Kawhi is that special of a basketball player. I believe in him that way. He is, you had a tweet, man. It cracks me up when you say that. My favorite thing about ex-player is that he just does this and he never misses. (laughs) Well, hold on, not about that player. It's Kawhi. Kawhi is the dude who gets where he wants on the floor and then doesn't miss. It's pretty impressive. It, it really is. And when he's locked, man, it is. It feels inevitable. It's like, oh, man, that's a really bad shot. That was great defense. That was great defense. Splick, doesn't matter. It's going in. Like, Kawhi's strength advantage that he can exert over basically anyone in the league, the elite pull-up shooting, the fact that he can get to the rim, and all of the actions. Go to NBA.com, look at every play type. Kawhi is one of the most efficient guys across the board. Off screen, spot up, handoffs, pick and roll ball handler, whatever, man. Kawhi can do it all on the court. And he's one hell of a number one, coupled with what he brings you as a perimeter defender, as a cerebral defender, as a rebounder, as a playmaker now at his age. And how that's the that's the differentiator I would make between like a 
a guy who really dominates the ball. That's the thing that makes Kawhi so special is he's great with the ball in his hands and as a decision maker and as a playmaker, but he's also great with the ball out of his hands and moving off ball. And like he is that effective of an offensive player. It really doesn't matter. He can fit so seamlessly in any role you want to play him with. That's why he can work with a guy like Harden. That's also why he can work as your lead guy. Again, the only factor that is working against Kawhi Leonard in these situations is the health quotient and the fact that last year I had supreme faith in Kawhi going crazy in handling business, and we only got to see two games of it. I know Kawhi cares. I know he loves the game. He is one of the best players on the court in any given scenario. It's the love scars thing with Tatum, man. I just don't want to get burned again and have Kawhi play three games in these playoffs or four games and then get hurt. Uh... That is the only thing that limits from Kawhi going higher on my list. You know, LeBron may have his lapses in effort, but he was out there last year. Uh, Kawhi may not have those lapses in effort, but he wasn't available. And that was the distinction to me. Again, Kawhi's raw ability warrants him being a stamped top five guy, but it's the availability concerns. I get it. I have Kawhi at number seven. I kind of think that he has to be above LeBron at this stage just because of what they are doing relative to one another when they are on the court. Like Kawhi is still on that stage where he can be consistently unstoppable over four quarters, night after night. And there are guys who carry heavier burdens and I rewarded some of those guys over Kawhi, but it's ridiculous what he does. You mentioned the scoring efficiency by play type. I mean, let's go through it. His top five play types in terms of volume, ISO, 91st percentile efficiency, spot up 81st, transition 88th, pick and roll ball handler 82nd, post up 76th, like the guy really doesn't miss, and I talked about what makes Jimmy so great in those playoff settings, right, the fact that he's going to play at his own pace, he's a strong, compact wing who's going to get to his spots, and he has a lot of different spots, right? He can kill you from the mid range, from the short range. And so he's not reliant on just, hey, pull up three after pull up three. Oh no, those aren't falling. What do I do now? Kawhi is that, but on steroids, dude, just like juice the shot making way up because he makes 56% of his shots in the paint outside the restricted area. That very valuable range that we talk about. He is as good as anybody not named Nikola Jokic on the planet there. And so he is a dominant on-ball creator because of that. But he also is this big physical wing who isn't quite as quick as he was in his youth, but I still think his quickness is a little bit underrated. And he's a great finisher at the rim with his strength and length. Makes 75% of his shots in the restricted area. He's also 38% as a pull-up shooter from deep. 44% off the catch from deep. Just an absolute assassin, hyper-efficient scorer who in the playoffs, we know... You get him there, he is going to give you a hyper-efficient 30 a night. That is what he has done every year since the title run in Toronto. He gets to the playoffs, he goes up another level in terms of volume, and he blends that volume with an efficiency that no one else has achieved over a stretch that long. I consistently say him, Luka, and Jokic are the guys who in the playoffs have proven it over and over again with the volume and efficiency that what they do is just inevitable. And he is still a very valuable defender and he is a solid playmaker. The only reason that I have other guys above him is basically what you said. It's health. And uh, I don't just want to say health. I also think it is like, can your body carry the burden of being a consistent number one over an entire playoff run? Because LeBron's couldn't. And uh, Kawhi's, I think because of his youth, like he can handle it a little bit more, but because of his injury issues, he can't handle it as well as basically all the guys above him. And so that's the reason that I have Kawhi at number seven. He's absolutely capable of playing like a top five guy in the playoffs. We've seen it time and time again. And he is going to do some crazy stuff there if he stays healthy. But that is a question for him more than basically anybody else, even though he's been quite healthy this year. So we have LeBron and Kawhi flipped. I have Kawhi at seven. You have LeBron at seven. Who's in your sixth spot? In my sixth spot is a guy we've already discussed. Uh, I have Anthony Davis. Okay. Very interesting. So real quick, why is it 80 over LeBron for you? Partly it's because of what you mentioned about the effort uh, aspect about LeBron is, you know, I can trust Anthony Davis. 
I don't know about being aggressive or as confident as we have seen recently in the playoffs consistently. It's more of an effort thing defensively. And again, the I think Anthony Davis, I think, still is what makes the Lakers great. I think the Lakers are a really good team, too. Especially, like, I, I've talked about Reeves and D'Lo. Dude, I don't know if the Lakers are, are in the playoffs if, you know, D'Lo and Reeves are, aren't doing what they're doing. Uh, especially D'Lo, man. God, D'Lo has blown me away this year. I've Vince been the Bucks, so... it was Austin, though. He was going crazy. Uh, yeah, that deep... Oh, dude, I thought he was going to game it, too, with that bank three when he pulled from, like, 30. Go screen oh. Austin Reeves is unstoppable, bro. He's the best player in the NBA. Another unguardable LeBron action. Go screen with Austin Reeves. Good luck. So, big credit to those guys, but... AD, I think, is what gives the Lakers that championship ceiling. The fact that night in, night out, AD can... Not effectively X out your team's best offensive player, but he's the most equipped. I'd say even more than Bam, right? I think Bam's the most versatile uh, defender in the league in terms of how we can defend in isolation and uh, how, mm-hmm. I mean, it just the way he effortlessly just switches on and will defend everybody. Right. He's but, the most switchable big in the league for sure. Exactly. But AD just wrecks games. And the I think interior that dominance baseline, is on a different level. I, I think it just, it gives him an advantage and it, it's what makes it what's, it's what gives the Lakers such a high floor. And I know the numbers don't suggest it. Like, defensive rating-wise, when AD's out there on the floor, but come playoff time, I think you're going to see it live in the flesh. And that's the distinction to me. You know, I, LeBron is what can get this team a chip. LeBron is the reason that this mm-hmm. team could potentially still make it through the Western Conference Finals and get there. And well, you need great. I'm not I'm not predicting it, but if we got superhuman yeah, LeBron, it, would, you, would you really if they need beat that the Nuggets, If they beat the Nuggets, bro... I don't know what I would do. I would do something crazy. I would twerk <laughs> on stream. I really don't think the Los Angeles Lakers are beating the Denver Nuggets. I don't think so either, but LeBron, I think, is the guy that can get the Lakers to reach their absolute apex, their ceiling, but Anthony Davis is the one that gives them a really solid floor. And, mm-hmm. again, because of LeBron's lapses in effort, uh, AD gives me that strong baseline, and he's been out there more. So it was. That was honestly, along with trying to figure out where Kawhi goes on this list, if Jason Tatum should make it, LeBron versus Anthony Davis was one of my toughest arguments uh, on this ranking. Yeah, it really does kind of come down to preference because I don't think there's really disputing that AD carries the Lakers more at this stage in LeBron's career. Throughout the playoff run last year, and again, that wasn't the best LeBron because he couldn't make a jumper and his foot was hurt, but... AD was unquestionably the best player throughout a majority of that run. But then even that version of LeBron, when you got to like the do or die games, who was going to be the best player on the floor? It was LeBron. There was just an unstoppability offensively that he can reach that is so, so valuable. And I think that I value that peak level that LeBron is able to give you when it matters most a little bit more than the fact that AD is going to give you this defensive floor that is unbelievable and is probably going to be the backbone of why the Lakers are a dangerous playoff team. So I do think it's close between the two of them. You, you're you high on both those Lakers, man. AD at number six, he's just not consistent enough offensively for me to have him there. I just know that he's going to have a couple performances if they make it multiple rounds in the playoffs where you're like, man, man, AD, that was soft. That was weak or his touch shots aren't following. And then he just kind of crumples and he's an amazing basketball player. But that reality is something that I don't feel about any of the other players on this list. And Kawhi is just so consistently dominant as a scorer and a really high impact two way guy. I would pretty confidently say Kawhi is much more capable of actually carrying a team to a deep playoff run than AD. Can I ask you something about, uh, like, overarching about AD sure. in LA? Do you think, sure. are you disappointed by Anthony Davis's development as an offensive player, kind of like under the wing of LeBron? I know when he came here, everybody's idea was like, oh, he's going to be like, LeBron's going to take him under his wing and he's going to do mm-hmm. all this stuff. Maybe, you know, that was kind of unreachable like the expectations that we put on him when he was under the wing of LeBron but have you been disappointed by AD's offensive development in LA I would say I've been underwhelmed but the biggest reason for that is just that he never took the leap as a jump shooter outside of the bubble People talk about New Orleans AD as if he was like this perimeter machine and he was quicker he's 
obviously just gotten older, but he's also added size in LA, which has compromised his quickness as an initiator a little bit. That's true. But this notion that he was ever like a good three-point shooter with any sort of volume just isn't true. Now, it's gotten worse, and it got to the point where it's like, okay, AD, don't take threes at all. That's just disappointing. That's kind of it to me. If he had grown into the jump shooter that he showed potential for at times, then I think... He could have been in the conversation for best player in the world at a couple points throughout his career. But ultimately, it's never like he was a consistently very good jump shooter. And so you can't be shocked that that didn't pan out. So I would say I've been underwhelmed. I don't know about outright disappointed. I've been happy with what we've seen the last two years because the two seasons immediately after the title, yes, I was disappointed with that version of AD. That AD was not a top 10 player and offensively was just flat out disappointing. The thrill and excitement of March Mania is here in DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top rated sportsbook apps, is giving new customers a shot to turn five bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. And North Carolina listeners, don't forget DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code NERDS. New customers can bet five bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code NERDS. The crown is yours. My number six is Steph Curry, Logan, a man who last year you famously had at number 10. You seem no, shocked. No, no, I, I didn't do that. that was, yes, you let's did. Like wipe that off the slate, man. You that didn't did happen. indeed. And I had Steph higher last year than I do this year. I do think that Steph has taken a slight step back. I think you can blame most of the fact that his production and efficiency isn't quite on par with what it was last year on the fact that he's in a really rough situation. But I also think he has lost a little bit of a step athletically, and that's made him particularly reliant on his three-point shot and oftentimes these tough pull-up threes. Again, not aided by the situation, but he's taking a career low percentage of his shots at the rim, just 7%. And that number was 15% in 2021, his great dominant offensive regular season. In his second MVP season, 2016, it was 23%. So it's half of what it was a few years ago, just three years ago. It's less than a third of what it was when you're talking about like peak Steph Curry. So I do think it's relevant to just hammer home how low a number 7% is. He's also making 52% of his two-pointers, which is his lowest number since 2014. Again, because he is not getting to the rim as much, and so he's taking a little bit more of those tough intermediate shots. And that has contributed to a volatility with him as a scorer that we certainly did not see last year. He has 15 games scoring under 20 points this season. He had just five last year. And in some ways, that's sort of reminiscent of the 2022 regular season when we then saw Steph obviously have a really good title run, but that was like his worst regular season in a long time in terms of volume and efficiency. And there was an inconsistency that season, but I do think this year we can tie it even a little bit more directly to his specific reliance on uh, the same shots in a way that we haven't seen from Steph historically, even though he's obviously the greatest three-point shooter of all time. He's averaging a career low in assists this year, and for the first time in his career, the on-off king, Steph Curry, the ultimate team impact merchant, has a negative on-off number. That's first the Chris time Paul ever. effect, baby. Yeah, that's the Chris Paul effect, actually, because he's also an on-off king team impact merchant. Like I said, I do blame most of this on his situation. The guy has an absurd offensive burden without high-end threats alongside him, and so teams dedicate so much defensive attention to him, and they don't really get punished. But I do think we have seen a little bit of regression. That being said, the Warriors still play as an 80th percentile offense with Steph on the floor. Think about that, considering the surrounding personnel. Crazy impressive. They're still 36 and 29 when he plays and one in five when he doesn't. He still leads the league in clutch points per game this season on 66% true shooting. He is still coming off of consecutive dominant offensive playoff runs. I know that maybe he left a little bit to be desired in terms of efficiency in that Lakers series, but he controlled that series. He was just missing shots from the perimeter that he normally makes. And then the year before that is the title run and still 
We're talking about him as a floor raiser right now because of the pieces around him, but he would be the ultimate ceiling raiser with better offensive personnel around him because that is what Steph has always done. He just reshapes defense in a way that is totally unique. I did consider him versus Kawhi. I really considered him versus Kawhi because I think Kawhi gets what he wants more easily at this stage in his career. That's just kind of undeniable. But what Steph does in terms of his team impact to carry an offense... I still think exceeds Kawhi's. And again, the physical toll, could Kawhi handle that? I don't really think so. So I'm going to reward Steph for that. But I do think there are guys who just have more overwhelming physical advantages at this stage in their career. And obviously Steph has never been the guy with physical advantages, but he's not the same athlete that he was even a few years ago. And that's not surprising when you're 35 years old. He is as great as a player of that age could reasonably be but i do have him at number six or he's 36 now he turned 36 a couple weeks ago steph was one of the hardest guys to rank on this list uh not because i foolishly ranked him at number nine last season uh i argued whole started at 10 started at 10 you moved him up to nine i had to convince you to move him up to nine argued 2a impact it was easier to drop steph from top three top five conversations this year because of what you mentioned uh the athletic decline and i think another number uh that really points to it is uh he's only driving 8.7 times per game uh since that stat started being tracked in 2014 uh i think his actually his mvp season was lower he was like eight drives per game but he was so absurd uh from behind the arc but you know consistently even these past couple of years he's 10 11 12, 13 per, you know, he's just better at getting downhill. And then you talk about the rim numbers, 14% of his shots coming there. It's real. And I do worry about Steph having an insane burden on his shoulders. The thing that made him hard to rank was, in my opinion, the toughest guy to argue against was him versus SGA. And I asked my roommates, I went back and forth with both of these guys I couldn't do it, and the only reason I couldn't put SGA above Steph just yet was just because I haven't seen it. And I also think it's hard, Carson, like all those things you mentioned about Steph's absurd situation, that's what really makes this hard to gauge. Mm -hmm. It's like, how much is this Steph's absurd situation that he is being tasked with elevating versus him? And so I tried to remove as many factors, you know, just looking at him as a player. Some of the greatest gravity ever. One of the best off-ball movers and relocators in NBA history. Defenses always have to respect him if they fall asleep. But his limitations are real now. And you were seeing the decline. It's, 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 all, it's heartbreaking, man. You know, Carson, I started watching well, ball. Well, let's and... not be overly dramatic. Steph's still amazing, no, all right? Still we're not watching I'm... a washed... We're not watching Celtic Shaq out there, for yeah, God's sake. But I'm talking about... You know, this is the first kind of... Heartbreaking. It is, man. I'm talking about just You're in general. You're melodramatic. Bro, KD being out of the top 10. KD is still nice as hell, though. We can't say it's heartbreaking. But it's I'm just saying the it's, little things. I'm saying it's coming. You can see it on the horizon, man. And that thought is like, damn, that sucks. I don't want to watch that, man. That's my guy. Like, that's going to be... We're also talking about longevity. How the fuck is LeBron doing this at 40, man? What the fuck? <laughs> Makes no sense. Uh, shout it's out insane. modern, shout out modern medicine, uh, shout out working out, shout out taking care of your body, shout out yeah, TV 12. For real. Uh, no. <laughs> Steph was one of the hardest guys to rank. I ended up giving him the nod. I took him over SGA and that was really hard to do because I think SGA has a real argument that especially with the regular season success that we got from the kid this year, the two way value. And you talk about Kawhi and LeBron and how much of the burden that they can take offensively, that is one thing that I think SGA has now and is going to have for years to come is the fact that his stamina, his cardio, his ability every possession down to dictate, get to his spot or play make and control the game is insane. It, it, even in late game scenarios, it's like SGA doesn't get tired. Like it just, he's able to every possession down just keep going. It's I don't want to compare it to like Harden, but it's Harden-esque in how much he can dominate the ball and just keep attacking. Uh, SGA versus Steph was one of the hardest ones on my list, and I ended up giving the nod to Steph. And I put SGA at five, and I put Steph at four. I'm wondering if I got it wrong, though. I, I don't know, man. It's I'm still debating it now. I'm going to stick to it because I believe in Steph. I know what Steph has done. It was just 
you know, two years ago where Steph climbed the mountain again. So mm-hmm. we're not that far removed, and it is a tough situation. But that was one of the toughest conversations I have with myself on this list, Steph versus SGA, and I went with Steph. It is a tough one. I went with SGA. I have SGA at number five. He is the highest floor scorer in the NBA. Over the last 40 years, the only players to have 50 30-point games in a season are MJ, James Harden, Kobe, T-Mac, and now SGA. And with the pace he's on, he should join the 55-game club, which would knock T-Mac out. So then it would just be him, MJ, Harden, and Kobe, who are like the guys to have these special volume scoring seasons over that stretch. He is also the first guard ever to score 30 points per game, making 54% of his shots from the field. Just raw field goal percentage. So there is a consistency and an efficiency that he has shown this year that is all-time special. And I've raved about the guy a lot, but he just has an answer for everything. There's no way to guard SGA. He comfortably leads all guards in the NBA in restricted area makes, and he's an elite finisher there. He is simply put the toughest guy to stay in front of in the league right now because he is the shiftiest mover on the planet, and his paint footwork is absurd. His body control on spins is absurd. He's incredibly tough to keep away from the rim. But then he is also the best in the planet at stopping on a dime and killing you with his short range shot making. He is top five in the league in makes inside the paint, outside the restricted area, shoots 53% there, has an unbelievably deep bag of step backs and turnarounds. He's just money. He's sixth in mid range makes, shoots 48% from there. And has a variety of ways to get to those shots. Out of isolation, he is devastating. Out of pick and roll, he is devastating. As a post-up mismatch attacker, he scores with 90th percentile efficiency. Has a legitimately deep bag there. Step through, spins. He is just next level crafty. And the one thing that you would think you can live with is him taking threes. And he's shot 39% on step back threes. So if you give him that room, if you try to... Give yourself a little bit of cushion so he's less devastating as a driver. He's ultimately going to punish you with very efficient shot making there as well. So he just has the deepest bag of counters in the league right now. And he dominates the painted area in a way that is so valuable. And he does it with shot making, not just rim force, which is so valuable for these playoff settings. I mean, just absurdly efficient across play types. Also, a really good playmaker. I wouldn't call him elite there but consistently is going to dissect you and make the right decisions. Very good live dribble passer. And he's a plus defender, especially off ball. Good help defender, can be impactful as a low man, has good timing there as a shot blocking guard, and then has awesome hands, great length, and can be really impactful in passing lanes and making timely strips. So he's a big defensive playmaker and overall definitely a plus defender. And so I just think that sort of overall consistent dominance that you get from SGA, and when you consider the plus two-way value, I prefer to this slightly regressed version of Steph that we're seeing right now, but it is super close. And the ceiling that Steph has because of his off-ball value, because of the flame-throwing shot-making stretches he can go on from the perimeter, is probably higher than what SGA can do. Because the one thing SGA doesn't do is absolutely explode. He still doesn't have a 45 point game in his career, which is absolutely hilarious. Like he really is 31 point man. 31 point man is a pretty damn good thing to be, but he doesn't have the scoring and playmaking ceiling of a Luka Doncic. Luka's a better playmaker just flat out to begin with, but that guy can also rain eight step back threes on you in a game. And SJ isn't going to do that, but he is so, so consistent. And even though we haven't seen him in the playoffs, I do really believe in him in those environments. I think because he gets to his spots and I don't think physicality disrupts him, even though he's a slider guy, because he is so great at using angles and using his physicality as a driver as well to still win in those battles against physical defenders. And he's such a great shot maker that he just survives no matter what. I am super, super high on his playoff prospects. People try to make him out to be a foul grifter. I just don't agree with that characterization. I just don't like and he's not a guy who is reliant on getting to the line that's the key if you are a great shot maker if you make 54 percent of your shots you don't need to take 10 free throws in a game because you make 54 percent of your shots and the fact that there was that drive 
against the Timberwolves where he threw his head back. And then that just like circulated everywhere for two days. And that was the SGA discourse. And whenever anybody said anything about, oh my God, he's a grifter, they would just use that one clip and be like, see, isn't this disgusting? I think SGA draws a lot of legitimate fouls. I would not look at him as the problem child for getting to the line at a reasonable rate. I mean, the same rate as Luka Doncic, and he comfortably leads the league in drives per game, SGA does. The guy's amazing. I do want to see him prove it in the playoffs, but I think five is an appropriate spot for a guy who I know is going to have an obscenely high offensive floor, excel as a scorer, and be a really good playmaker and a plus defender. He's just a uniquely complete superstar. Yeah, SGA is one of the best downhill and rim pressuring guards in all the NBA. That's an invaluable skill set. And my favorite response to that discourse about him being a foul grifter was, oh my gosh, when the guy who leads the NBA and drives for a game also draws a ton of fouls, yeah. like head explode emoji. I mm, never would have guessed. Weird how that correlates. And also, man... It's like everybody does that, man. You watch Jokic. Look, man, if the refs are going to call that BS, guess what? The players are going to do it. Dude. Who would have thought? Dude, that's the thing. I <laughs> am the farthest in the world from ever, ever insinuating that Jokic gets a favorable whistle because he doesn't. He gets a super, super unfavorable whistle, but he still consciously makes an effort to throw his head back and flail his arms because that's what NBA superstars do these days. SJ drives five times more than any other player in the league. He drives 24 times a game next is Jalen Brunson under 19. Like, it's just not surprising he gets to the line a lot and he doesn't need to. And I do think his whistle is mostly going to translate to the playoffs. His free throw rate might go down a little bit. That happens for a lot of players. It's not going to tank his game. Exactly, bro. And uh, he averages... The biggest stat to me that says it's not going to tank in the playoffs, he's averaging 10.6 pull-up points per game on 48% from the field. That's the fifth most pull-up points per game in the NBA. Yeah. Minimum five field goals attempts per game. That's also the best field goal percentage outside of Chris Middleton and his teammate J-Dub. So it's like, Shout out. if he's not getting to the line, guess what? He just slams on the brakes and puts one up right in your mouth. Like, I think that... I really hope he shows up on the playoff stage because, you know, everybody's going to have a bad series here and there. It's inevitable, I feel like. And I don't want it to be SGA's first career playoff series ever because I know everybody else is going to come out with exactly what you said. Well, the, first playoff series is the guy because he's exactly, been there before. Exactly. As, as the number one option where he's expected to carry his team through. And I don't want it to be, oh, he's a foul merchant. He's a regular season guy. SGA's the man. And, uh, I think he is. I have the utmost faith that SGA is going to ball out on the biggest stage. I can't wait for it, man. And like I said, dude, I really considered him above Steph. I just ultimately, I couldn't do it. So you have SGA at five and Steph at four. So uh, things come back to me. Logan, I'm a little bummed you didn't include Joel Embiid on your list. I just, I'm, I'm going to keep it a buck. I kind of just thought he was going to be hurt, man. Well... I don't know if he should return. And frankly, I think if he does return, he's not going to play very well because he's not going to be healthy. Mm -hmm. And that's going to suck. And that's going to be annoying. But it does really seem like they are trying to get him back. Like the reports continue to be they want to have him for a regular season return. Where would you have had him? Just out of curiosity. I'm putting you on the spot here because I don't want to be on... Let an island ask, here with my Embiid takes. Let me ask a clarifying question. Am I getting, am I ranking healthy Embiid or this Embiid? Okay. Here's how I'm viewing it. Not an Embiid coming off of a significant injury. The way that I'm viewing health concerns is you're presuming that a guy enters the playoffs healthy. And then it's like, if they are still more likely to get hurt, like a Kawhi or an Embiid, okay, okay, that's okay to be a factor, but don't presume that they're going into it hurt. Presume that you are starting at least with the healthy best version of that player. That's how I'm doing it. I would have him at five, or no, okay. excuse me. I'd have him at six, Okay. and I would have him one spot, one spot ahead of AD, one spot below SGA. Uh, my rationale... I think he's a great interior presence, one of the best straight-up rim protectors and defensive anchors in the league. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I would give him the nod over AD, because while AD is a game-wrecking force, I'm getting a lot of the defensive value, but I'm getting a completely you know, much better yeah. offensive player. 
And the only reason that I can't put him above those guys, I know SGA hasn't proven it on the playoff stage, but uh, as we have documented uh, yeah. a, for a long time here on Nerd Sesh, Embiid is also another guy who has to prove it on the stage that uh, he can still be a great offensive player. And I just trust SGA's game offensively a little more uh, to translate than Embiid's. But uh, I don't know. I, I, I honestly, I'm kind of in the same boat with you, man. I don't really want Embiid to come back if he's not going to, you know. Because yeah. then, then the discourse is just going to be Embiid's a playoff choker, and that's going to be the narrative until next season when we were just patiently waiting and crossing our fingers that, that he's healthy again. So last year when we did this list, my most notable take, I would say, was that I had Joel Embiid at number eight. And it was, oh my God, that's so low. And I basically went through all of the playoff concerns that had previously been an issue for him and then were an issue again in last year's playoffs. And we've talked about this phenomenon before, Logan, but sometimes it's funny being early on things. I mean, again, we had seen that trend from Embiid, but a lot of people just chose to ignore it because then what you will often see is the pendulum swing too far in the other direction. And I think that Embiid is very polarizing right now, but my guess will be that there's a lot of people who see him at four when we're talking about projecting to these playoff environments and think that's too high. And I still have mixed feelings about it because I do like how certain guys games scale to the postseason relatively to what they are as regular season players more than Embiid. I think Kawhi just undeniably gets better in the playoffs. I do think SGA's game is very well built to hold up in the playoffs. Steph is just so proven there. But the ceiling that I see with a healthy Joel Embiid, when I think about what he is capable of, it's almost overwhelming. And I know a lot of people say the needle can't be moved for them by regular season Joel Embiid. The needle can't be moved for me to call him the best player on the planet by what we see in the regular season. But the needle was moved for me a bit by what we saw this regular season because this was like a significantly better version of Joel Embiid even than the version that won MVP last year. He improved as a shot maker. He improved as an offensive rebounder and just in terms of getting some of the easy stuff offensively, putback score, and he concretely improved as a playmaker. The guy is 280 pounds, shooting 50% from mid-range and 37% from deep this year and was legitimately playmaking well, averaging six assists a game, too. He is an unstoppable post-up and isolation force. Like, when you get Joel Embiid, who is making his jump shots like he does in the regular season, his rhythm-driven pull-ups, his turnarounds, you are just absolutely helpless. There is nothing you can do because he's bigger than you, stronger than you, and he's also more skilled than you. And then he also does the complimentary stuff offensively very well. Really good pick and roll and pick and pop score. Good spot up player with the level that he's been as a jump shooter this year. All that while being an elite pure rim protector, as you mentioned, towards the top of the league in terms of his uh, defensive field goal percentage allowed at the rim. I do think because of his mobility and at times because of his conditioning, he gets overrated as an overall defensive player because he has some issues in space. But I mean, he's a very high level defensive big, no matter how you cut it because of how great he is on the interior. So his ability to dominate a basketball game is nearly unrivaled. That is the ceiling that we see in the regular season when he is just dropping 35 on everybody's head effortlessly and dominating games defensively it is absurd but we also cannot ignore the nearly unprecedented postseason decline that we have seen from Embiid last two playoffs 23 points per game 2.4 assists to three and a half turnovers with an effective field goal percentage of under 48 keep in mind the league average is 54 percent over that time the reasons for that his jump shot has fallen apart I talk about how good he's been this year, where he's averaging like a point per jump shot. In the last two postseasons, he's averaged 0.59 points per jump shot and 0.7. So to put that in terms of field goal percentage, that's like making 30 to 35% of your two-point shots alone. Like, it's horrible, horrible offense. And B jump shots have been horrible offense, and that trend has been like, surprisingly consistent in the postseason throughout his career he's really struggled from mid-range and from deep but also last year he took a jump as a jump shooter so it was more surprising that his jump shot melted down like it did 
And this year, he was even better as a jump shooter. So I do think there's going to be a run where that holds up just because he's too good for it not to. And when he does, the ceiling is terrifying there. Then also the fact that he is a foul grifter. Embiid legitimately is. He uh, relies on fouls that get called in the regular season that will not in the playoffs. And his free throw attempts have gone down by a couple per game in those playoff environments. And so it's not just that he's missing out on a couple of free points. He's also costing himself possessions occasionally because he's just like flailing. And then that's a turnover or that's a bad miss. And you just can't afford to do that. His playmaking has also failed him. Teams send doubles. He turns the ball over too much. He can't dissect them appropriately. And he has been hurt. He's been dealing with injuries in uh, basically every playoff run that he's had. I mean, he's missed a game. He's been banged up with something. So the guy's incredibly, incredibly hard to rank. The couple things that I do not like still, I do not like the foul grifting in those playoff environments. Do not like it from Joel Embiid. But if he is knocking down his jumpers at the rate that he does in the regular season, it shouldn't matter that much. Like it shouldn't single-handedly be his undoing. It's what we talked about with Shea. If you're a great shot maker, you don't need to get to the line. And Embiid is capable of that. He just hasn't done it in the playoffs. And then the playmaking historically has been a real problem, but I do think he was significantly better there this year. So I am being more optimistic about Joel Embiid than I have been in the past. And you know what, Logan? I think I'm going to be exactly on the money with this. That's what I'm putting my bet down on. I was pessimistic about Embiid. I was lower on him than the consensus every time that he failed. And now that I am flipping to be a bit more optimistic, I'm still far from the biggest Joel Embiid guy. Uh, Philly fans, I'm sure, would tell you he's the best player on the planet or whatever. But I have him at number four because what he is capable of, I mean, just that overwhelming combination of physical dominance, skill, and what he can do defensively, it just exceeds what even SGA can do. It exceeds what Steph can do. It exceeds what Kawhi can do. So maybe the floor is a little bit lower because of what we've seen in these past couple playoff runs, but the ceiling is so disgustingly high that uh, I'm going to give him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt because he really, really did improve this year. Carson Brebber, the stonks man, dude. Selling stonks. high, buying low. Yeah. Genius. I'm like America Ferrera in that movie Dumb Money. Haven't seen it. I'm sure it's a bad Not great. Not really worth a watch. Oh, never and mind. She's not good in it. She's not good in anything. Freaking sucks. She's a horrible actress. Yes. Uh, and what was crazy about Embiid too, dude? Consistently 30 to 35 in three quarters, man. That's what I think people forget, bro. I mean, he was yeah. doing this in quarters, man. He, he wouldn't play the fourth, and he'd already have his full stat line. Like, yeah. I agree with you. I think... It's tough, man, because in the regular season, it is him bullying, like, matchups, but it's also unstoppable. Like, you watch it, and it's like there's literally nothing you can do. A lot of the defenders, the way they play him uh, at the line, right? Embiid's a guy, it's ironic, he's so strong, it's like you have to run this drop on him. Because if you give him the lane to the basket and you give him the hoop, well, it's, it's easy, because he's that big, and that's strong, and he's just going to take the lane. But if you drop on him, he just pulls up in your face, and he never missed. I... I wonder if Embiid needs to lose a few pounds. I had the same question about Nikola Jokic. I had the same question about Zion Williamson. Uh, Jokic, it was more of a conditioning thing. Zion, it was definitely an injury thing. And with Embiid, I wonder if it's an injury thing. Like, I wonder if his frame just needs 10 to 15 pounds to to breathe, to take some of this pressure off of him. Uh, it is scary for a guy that has this sordid an injury history from his first two seasons in the league to consistently year after year, him getting injured. I want to see a healthy Embiid. I want to see a maximized Embiid because I do believe he could be the guy to be the best player on a championship team for Philadelphia. And with the current construction of their lineup, you got Tyrese Maxey. I think he is a bona fide number two that can help. Like, if you get the best version of Joel Embiid, man, I think they can get it done. Uh, and I want to see it come to fruition. I would have him in my top 10. I wouldn't have him as high as you, but I still think he's that player. I think you're right, man. I think the pendulum is completely, now that he's been injured, of course, now for the majority of the season, Yeah, it's, you know, he's not going to get it done. He's too inconsistent. I believe in Embiid, and I just, I hope we can get a full, healthy playoff run where his jumper's on, man. I want to see it, you know? It's, it's yeah. great basketball. Uh, 
I don't think they should rush it though, man. If he's not 100%, no. I think they should just sit him and and punt this year. And although I think up to this point a vast majority of his playoff criticism is deserved, I do worry about what his legacy is going to become because he's 30 years old now and if he can't stay healthy, like he's just got to have that one run where he's healthy and can put it all together, but also they do need to have a legit contending team around him because this Philly team, I mean, they were dominant when he was on the floor. They're not winning the title as currently constructed. They need a little bit more talent. When you talk about his weight, we've had this conversation before. I just think he's an injury prone guy. Like he obviously missed two full seasons before he debuted in the league. And he was much slighter at that point in his career. I just think he's an injury prone guy. I don't want to put any blame on him for it. I just think, that's the unfortunate reality for him. But boy, what he is capable of when he is healthy is special. And so I do have him in my top five in the four spot because of that. Now we're into the top three though, Logan. And uh, we both have the same guys there in some combination or other. Who was in your three spot? Number three for me is uh, Luka Doncic, man. Uh what Luca does on a nightly basis, I think we just take for granted it at this point, but it really is truly absurd. This season, yeah. 34, 9, and 10. And I want to be specific about something, man. This isn't like a Russell Westbrook, like 34, 9, and 10. Granted, you know, the team success, they may still be fighting in the play in. This is a legitimate, like, winning, contributing, best offensive engine, real 34, uh, 9, and 10. He's ridiculous. And when he is, when his shot is on, he is effectively unstoppable. I've talked about this on the show in the past, but it, like it makes no sense. It doesn't really look like Luca creates all that much separation, and it looks like guys will close out perfectly on him. It doesn't matter, you know. Like it, that step back three is unstoppable. It's like Jokic's Sambor shuffle, his touch shots. Like it's just an unstoppable shot that it seems like Luca can turn to, and it also gives to what you said. It gives him that ceiling where if his shot is on and that shot is falling you can have a 50 piece from Luca in the blink of an eye and he can steal the game from you. That's a big reason why I think, I think the Mavericks are a big sleeper team this year in this year's playoffs. They may be in the play in, but you've got one of the best offensive engines in basketball, one of the best scorers in basketball alongside another one of the best scorers in basketball and Kyrie Irving with a much more athletic, physical and long team around them with some shooters and complimentary guys that I think work. Uh, and I think Luka can be the best player in any given series against any given team in the field. That's the component, you know? Luka mm -hmm. can boss up and be the best guy in a playoff series. That matters. Uh, Luka's two-way impact is obviously what holds him back, in my opinion, from being two or number one. Giannis is one of the best defensive players on planet Earth. Jokic anchors the glass, is a good defender. I won't call Jokic great. And I think Luka has improved, too. Again, we had this discourse in the middle of the year. Some people were saying Luka was one of the best defensive players uh, was epic. on the planet. And I, I want to be clear, too. Like, Luka is a big dude. Yes. Like, in uh, Luka, can, Luka can wall up guys. Like, uh, Luka is strong. And in those matchups, mm -hmm. that's where he really succeeds. When guys are trying to get physical with him, doesn't have great foot speed. Effort, you question at times. Oh, yeah. Luca's Luca's a good defender, but he's just not No, in... he's not. No, he's not. No, he's not. I think Luca's not a good, good defender. defender. Yeah. I totally disagree. Luca is a good isolation and post-up defender, and that is the he's entire basis. Boy. He's, he's a he's thick, thick dude. as hell. Because he is. He's strong. You're not going to bully Luca. And, yeah, he's got good hands. Like, he's smart. But his effort overall defensively, not good. And his impact as a team defender... Because of that, not good. Like, he, it's just ridiculous, this narrative that has developed. And I won't allow you to even say that he's a good defender because in terms of his overall impact, I mean, defense is so much more about what you are doing off ball, your rotations, your ability to impact the game as a help side rim protector, all that. And Luka just really takes those aspects of the game off. That's and fair. he doesn't have great tools to impact the game there anyways because... Yes, he is strong, and that helps you in some one-on-one -on -one matchups, but to be quick, to be long, to uh, have a quick jump, to be that sort of nimble athlete is what's generally going to help you as an off-ball help defender, and that's not that's, where Luka is going to excel. He's not that's fair. That I was talking more on-ball, but I do agree. There are times where Luka will overhelp on a drive. He'll fall asleep in the corner. Uh, he'll lose his guy. I get that. That makes sense, but... 
I guess I just meant to say Luca's thick. Luca's a thick dude. Well, if that's what you meant to say, you could have just yeah. said that, buddy. Nobody's going to judge you for that. I guess, I guess that was the take. Luca's a thick dude who can wall up guys uh, on ball. Um, that's, yeah. what I'll go, that's what I'll go with for today. His, okay. impact, his impact isn't there of a Giannis or Jokic, obviously, but what Luca does offensively can sink a team. I mean, look what he did in the Western Conference Finals run. Now, I want to give a ton of credit to Jalen Brunson too for picking up the slack when Jokic or yeah, when uh, Luca wasn't out there. But Luca is fully capable of doing that at any given time, and Luca's one of those guys, Carson, where I feel like if he just gets into the playoffs, there's a chance. You know what I mean? It doesn't really matter what seed he is. Like, there's a chance that Luca could go supernova and sink your team. That's why he's up here. Uh, I think he's got to be top three. I could hear an argument for two. Probably wouldn't hear an argument for one. Yeah. I would definitely hear an argument for two because I really value guys who are just unstoppable half-court offensive players. And uh, I think that Luka is in that tier. I do think that Jokic is on a different level because of how conducive his play style is to playing with other great players and also because of the efficiency gap. So, like, Jokic is a better, more realized version of the unstoppable half-court player. But... What Luca does is ridiculous. I mean, you mentioned 34, 9, and 10 on really good efficiency, 61% true shooting. The fact that that is real is insane. He is unstoppable as a one on one score, isolation. I mean, just everything with the ball in his hands, pick and roll. He is so strong. He has such phenomenal change of pace, and he is such an absurd touch shot maker. He's going to get what he wants at will. He shoots 55% in the paint outside the restricted area. And the biggest improvement in his game. The reason that he's having a career season above all else is that he is 37.5% from deep this year and over 38% on step back threes. To be that consistently efficient from beyond the arc, it's the thing that Luka has done in the playoffs, part of the reason he's been so incredible there, but in the regular season over the past years, it's been inconsistent. Like he came into the league a very spotty three-point shooter just in terms of his efficiency because of the degree of difficulty. You could tell that he had really good touch and was a gifted three-point shooter, but he'd only make 32% because he's taking all these tough step backs. Now he makes those really efficiently. And that makes him truly unstoppable because then he can also make every single pass in the book, skip passes, lobs, with just absurd deception. He's going to get you a good shot every time down the floor. And his playoff resume is absurd. 32, 9, and 8 on 55% effective field goal percentage. That's just his pure shot making from the field because he's had weirdly bad free throw stretches in the playoffs. I would take him over Embiid because he is so much more proven as an offensive performer in the playoffs. Like that's where I have to draw the line is with Luka. His entire control of the game as both a scorer and playmaker and that combination of physical dominance and skill scoring from everywhere on the floor. It's just overwhelming. I can't deny that. The only reason he can't be higher is because, again, Jokic has more solved offensive basketball and uh, has even more overwhelming size and physical advantages. And so he's just a more efficient offensive hub. And uh, Luka, although I think he does a phenomenal job of creating shots for his teammates who aren't necessarily the most skilled, can still max out his cohesiveness in terms of play style with others and he is the weakest defender on this list as we already talked about i would definitely hear a case from it too i wouldn't really hear one for him at number one although i'm sure there will be a moment in the playoffs where luca is doing his thing and people want to say this guy's the best player in the world and it's not insane it's just Nikola Jokic also exists. So I guess that's a spoiler for who i have at number one but i don't think that's really going to surprise anybody who ever watches our show who is a number two for you though logan uh, surprise, surprise, uh, the nerds have Nikola Jokic at number one. I yeah, have Giannis shocker. Antetokounmpo at my number two spot. Hmm. Uh, you gotta have Giannis here, in my opinion. His complete impact, like, you know, you, it's, it's like Luka. You know, that it's so routine for them that it's almost like you can take them for granted at some points, and then you watch them, and it's, they're effectively unstoppable. And Giannis might not have the most graceful game, but it is unstoppable. Uh, the lobs, the verticality over the top of the defense. If your big man is out of position by an inch, sorry, Giannis is going to yam it on your head over the top. Uh, he's great at getting to the basket. Like Giannis is such a freak athlete, spinning, one steps. Like he just makes it look effortless getting to the basket. So strong, so physically imposing. Like Giannis doesn't have a, a graceful, beautiful game. It's brute force. 
it, but it just works. Uh, 31 points. 31 points a night, 11 boards, 6 assists on 61% from the field. That's another aspect that I've been really impressed with Giannis this year is his playmaking on the inside. His ability to Mm -hmm. get out of a layup or a dunk and kick it back out to the corner. Uh, Mm -hmm. His ability to recognize when the defense is collapsing on him and sending extra help, if that's three defenders, if that's two. Giannis has really developed as a playmaker, and that's a big reason of why I didn't put Luka over him. You know, if that gap was wider... Maybe I would. And again, Luka's in a completely different ballpark, in my opinion, as an offensive player. It's a defensive gap that gets Giannis here, but Giannis is a legitimately good playmaker. And it may not be in the typical sense, but when he creates his advantages for those teammates and the defense collapses on him, boom. Giannis is kicking that ball out. One of the best defenders on planet Earth. One of the best rebounders. Giannis is a freak, man. It's in the name. He's the Greek freak. Uh, And he's effectively unstoppable. It's the two-way value and... Again, man, it's not the most elegant game. Sometimes I'm like, man, that's ugly, but it just gets it done, dude. He just gets it done. Giannis has never been one like one of my favorite guys to watch, yeah. but it's damn sure effective, man. And uh, again, I, it, it's ironic, but I couldn't have any other two guys here. They're the two guys that have climbed the mountain most recently, and that's why they're here. If another guy does it. If it's Tatum and it gets him to creep into my top 10, if it's Luka and he creeps into my top 10, I'll hear you out. But those guys are uh, top two until somebody else replaces them, you know? I feel bad, dude. Whenever you talk about Giannis, you just talk about how ugly you think his game is. I mean, come on, man. We're talking about a top two basketball player on the planet here. I'm off that. I'm going to talk about where Giannis is even better than last year and even better than ever before. And I do think that collectively, and we are absolutely guilty of this, I am guilty of this, I'll speak for myself, just taking for granted how absurdly dominant Giannis is night to night. And the advantage that I think he always has over Nikola Jokic in a regular season context is Giannis is going to bust his ass every single night. Sometimes Jokic just takes nights off and Giannis does not do that. 31-11-6 on 65% true shooting for the two seed considering all the flaws around him, that's insane. And he has improved clearly in several areas this year. First of all, shot selection. He is taking fewer threes than ever before, which is such a simple thing and such an obvious thing. But bro, in 2020, Giannis was taking five threes a game. This year, he's taking 1.7. A Giannis three is always going to be a bad shot. It doesn't mean, it doesn't matter if you leave him open and he thinks, oh, I have to take this to keep the defense honest. Don't Giannis, you're not keeping the defense honest. You're just going to miss. But diminishing the bad shots has been a real positive. And he's also getting all the way to the rim at an absurd rate, like a career best rate. He's making nine shots per game in the restricted area. That was under seven two years ago. So fewer bad shots, more good shots. That means he's scoring with career best efficiency, over 65% true shooting. He has also been a little bit better in terms of his touch shot making, which again, that's always going to be a bad shot for Giannis, but he was 32% on twos outside the restricted area last year. This year, he's 37%. And so there's improvement there. And really, you hit on the playmaking. This is the best we've ever seen him there. He is doing the best job in his career of both taking the simple stuff and delivering those more advanced, impressive, improvisational kickouts. And he's averaging a career-high 6.4 assists per game because of it. So as an offensive player and an offensive engine, he is the best he's ever been. And I think that is true in a vacuum, even outside of the fact that he's playing with Dame because they still haven't made the most of that two-man game. Giannis individually is the best he's ever been offensively, and he's powering a 92nd percentile offense when he's on the floor. At the same time, I do think this is the weakest defensive Giannis that we've seen since he reached his peak, and I am far from putting a majority of the blame for Milwaukee's defensive issues this year on Giannis because he is one of its saving graces. But I do think as a help defender, he hasn't been as overwhelmingly dominant as we're used to. Normally, you look at like Giannis's defensive field goal percentage allowed at the rim, and it's like 17, 20% lower than what people normally shoot. And you're just like, what the hell? This year, it's a more human eight. Still very good, but 
in terms of what he can do as a help side rim protector blowing stuff up he hasn't been as impactful there and also adrian griffin was having him guard in space a bit more earlier this year so the system wasn't as favorable for that and as a defensive rebounder he hasn't been as dominant as we're used to like his defensive rebound rate in 2020 was 35 percent. now it's just above 26 percent. so he's still really really good at both those things but he's not at peak defensive Giannis level still a really good defender just a little bit of a step down defensively coinciding with that step up offensively the reason he can't be number one to me is because of the lack of high-end offensive skill in the half court so here I will have to just briefly rag on Giannis it's what we saw in the Miami series the lack of over-the-top shot making the fact that if you put a elite physical defender who can match up with him in those isolation settings in the half court we cannot bully his lack of skill becomes a problem we just saw it against the lakers in crunch time of that game with ad on him like at times you get these labored out of control drives and uh, he's just not skilled enough as a shot maker to lead a crunch time offense so that's the difference really Jokic cannot be stopped fundamentally I don't think there's anything that you can do Giannis can in specific matchups and in specific contexts but his all-around impact is so monstrous that I still think it exceeds everybody else and I do value that he has climbed the mountain and had such a dominant run in 2021 and is a better offensive player than he was then Giannis is amazing I do not want to take him for granted he is just number two to a player who's really having an all-time special peak right now and that is Jokic so Logan we need to set a timer on ourselves here be efficient be concise this really applies more to me than you but why is Jokic number one I just want to say two all four of your top four guys are international players too man it's nuts yeah because they softened up the league to let these guys yeah, in. yeah man no it's crazy dude it's crazy all five bro I have SGA, a Canadian, at number yeah. five. Yeah, It's no unbelievable. Lie. Shout out to the growth of the game. Wemby will be here next year, probably. <laughs> probably. It's it's awesome to see. Uh, we do got the shot clock on us here with Jokic. Uh, we give enough Jokic spiels as is. I'll just highlight, I, I gave a brief version of the spiel on uh, Jason's show. The thing that's so remarkable about Jokic, man, is how like all of his teammates buy in to like, the culture that he has set for the team, that how unselfish he is, how beautiful his playmaking is. Everybody else buys in too, man. If it's making that extra pass to the corner, if it's making that extra pass to the wide open guy, this entire team buys in to it as well. They have bought into Jokic's play style perfectly. I mean, and that's Michael Porter. Well, maybe not Mike. Sometimes Michael Porter Jr. will put it up, but he's normally hidden. He's normally knocking down the shot uh, if he's taking it, if he's taking the contest. This team just buys in. Jokic is one of the most unselfish guys of all time. He's an unstoppable post scorer. He is one of the most brilliant playmakers I've ever seen. He has eyes in the back of his head. There was one pass the other game, and I can't remember which it was, and he does this every game. But he's standing on the uh, left high block, uh, on the left elbow, posted up. Uh, the guy from the weak side right corner starts cheating on the low block. Jokic never turns his head. He just fires a pass literally just behind his head to the corner crazy velocity right to the guy's chest boom easy three-pointer he is just one of the most brilliant beautiful passers and playmakers i've ever seen coupled with the unstoppable half-court scoring touch from everywhere on the court he's a genius he is a basketball savant and he's one of the best offensive players i've ever seen give me that guy any day of the week man yeah listen i have said that i think he is the best offensive player ever and i think he's definitely the best half court offensive player ever he's the best scorer and passer on the planet simultaneously he's just solved offense i mean you get him the ball in the post you get him the ball anywhere in the is intermediate <laughs> area of the floor he's going to make 65 to 70 percent of his shots or he is going to make the perfect pass if it's Darren gordon in the dunker spot if it's a kick out to a shooter if it's a skip pass whatever it's going to be he is going to execute perfectly and dude it's so funny like i would never ever gamble on Jokic with a backside double like any sort of sneaky play to try to strip him the dude actually has eyes in the back of his head like i don't understand it his anticipation there is legitimately superhuman so there's just nothing you can do and he elevates his level in the postseason what he did last year is uh probably the greatest purely offensive playoff run that we've ever seen it's certainly up there i would take it as number one 
30, 13 and a half, and nine and a half on 63% true shooting, drawing th the three best defensive bigs in the league. Like, that's who we went through with Gobert and AD and Bam. And every single one of them was just left ultimately helpless at this guy who is so overwhelmingly huge and strong and smart and skilled as a touch shot maker. I mean, kind of sounds like glazing, but shit, that's just the reality. Like, the dude leaves defenses hopeless and without answers. And the gap between his ability to do that and everybody else, even Luka, to me, is still significant because of how Jokic controls the game from the middle of the floor, can do it within the flow of an offense, get two shots that are literally 65 to 70% no matter what. Nobody else on the planet can do that. He's number one. He is compelling one of the best offenses that we've seen, and I think he is the best offensive player that we've ever seen. And that unstoppability is going to exceed even the two-way advantage that a great, great player like Giannis does have. So there you have it, folks. Our top 10 players in the league. Wow. Marathon episode for a sick man like me on my deathbed. We still had to talk for almost two hours because this is an important topic. I'm very glad that we did this episode, Logan, but definitely some really painful cuts and painful decisions throughout. Any last words from you as you reflect on your list? Is Jokic like basketball artificial intelligence, man? Is he AI? More on that on the next show. Logan got a puppy. Logan, why don't you show everybody your puppy? She's I mean, slumped. wouldn't that be nice? She slumped right It will now. wake her up. Hello, baby. Wake her up. This is uh, this is Juice, uh, a.k.a. Juju. Named after O.J. Simpson, Logan's yes, favorite football my favorite. player. Hi, oh, Juju. come Say on. Say hi. <laughs> Look at that little pooch. Oh, my God. How about that? Have you taught her any tricks yet? Uh, I'm currently trying to get her to not shit on the floor. That's, can she that's say, the trick. That's can the she trick. say, go Steelers? working on that dude she hasn't barked once she has not barked once in three days that's fantastic but maybe you should get her checked out that sounds like you may have a mute dog on your hands i don't know all right guys that's gonna do it for us if you want more nerd sesh content we uh, of course have all of our full shows on the youtube page you can listen to the show across audio platforms and on our youtube page we also do Video essays, video breakdowns. Sorry we haven't done one in a couple weeks. That's because I've been sick. I've had one mostly done for that whole time. So when I am feeling better, I will finish that. And uh, you can follow us across social media, TikTok, Instagram, at NerdSesh, Twitter, at Nerd underscore Sesh. You can check out our merch at thevolume.com. And if you want to join our Discord for a chance to talk to the one and only Matthew Spawn Hour, you can do so through the link at our link tree that is across our social media bios. So with that, as always, appreciate you guys. Hope you've enjoyed. I've been Carson Brabber. I have been Logan Camden. And this was Nerd Sesh. Nerd Sesh.